All right, problem six, we have the prices in dollars, in thousands of dollars of the 35 used cars at a certain car dealership are shown in the table below. We have the price in the first row and the frequency in the second row. So which of the following best describes the shape of the distribution of used car prices at the dealership? Okay, so um, the best, I mean, the best way is just to maybe draw a little sketch. If you, if you, I mean, you can mentally picture it, but, um, you know, if you don't trust yourself or maybe, you're, you know, you're always going to be a little anxious or nervous during a, during a big test, just draw a picture. I always recommend draw a little, like, a, a sketch. It's going to be... It's not to be the cost of drawing, just make it reasonable. So um let's let's just put the price, let's put seven, eight, nine, ten, away to sixteen. Now Again, you can look and see that the highest point is over here, centered at nine. So you know, it's, it goes, there's seven, there's seven values at nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and four, four over here, one, two, three, four, six there. Yeah, this is just a rough sketch. But um, you want to be able to see like, okay, it's, it's increasing, you know, as you're, as you're going to nine, but then it's starting to decrease. But then the, this, as you can see, this is not going to be the center. It's, it's the, the difference from 10 to 16 is much greater than it is. It's twice as long as it is from, from seven to 10. At 10, it goes back to six. Four, 11, there's four of them. 12, there's two. 13 there's two, 14 there's two. So, so it starts to veer off, you can see. It starts to, you know, it starts to have long, a long tail way on the other side. It's skewed, it's skewed to the right. So you could say it's positively skewed. That's essentially what they're getting at. I think this is, they just want to make sure you know that, that basic definition. Um, left skewed would be if the tail is going to the left. Bimodal is when you have two, um, Two uh two peaks of the same um of the same height. Like you have like um, remember mode means the most common occurring mode is the most common occurring value. By mode is means you have two values that occur, you know, the same amount. Maybe so maybe in other words, maybe you had nine and like sixteen, they both occurred, you know, seven times. Uniform, um, you know, looks it's symmetric. Approximately normal, you should know that. So the answer is B for sure. All right, problem seven. Data were collected on the number of text messages sent by each student in a large high school for one day. The box plot of the data is shown below. Okay, so let's first make sure we re remember what a box plot um, shows. Because a common thing for students to um, mix up is you get a and me too, I'll admit that, you know, I have to go against my, you know, my, I, I, my, my, um, my initial reaction. Because when you see this, you're gonna think, oh, there's a lot of data in here. It's so big or so wide. And there's, there's very little here. But these values, there's 25% in this range, 25% in this from here to here, 25% from here to here, from the median to Q3 and 25% in, in Q3 to the max. So the amount of values in each of these portions, is remember this is the minimum, Q1, median, Q3, maximum. Their lengths, their lengths can vary. Like to the how, like, you know, you can see this, this is much more, you know, much more, you know, condensed. The range, the, the range there, or the amount of variability is much, much less than it is from from this point, which is Q1, Q1 to the median. But there's still a same, the same amount of people in that group, meaning that if there was like a thousand people, thousand students, there would be 250 in each of those groups. So the amount of people in each of those 
um, interval is the same. So that's kind of what you want to make sure you understand. But let's let's go through these. Let's see what they're trying to get you with. So there are more students with data values below the median than there are with data values above the median. No, because again, 50% is above, 50% is below. Half the data. Um, let me just do this. The median's in the middle. Remember that remember that's Q1 and it's a minimum. Q3 and the max. That's a five number summary. There's 50% above the median, 50% below the median. Doesn't matter how how much more wide one side is than the other. It's not A. There are more students with data values between the first quartile and the median than there are students with data values between the median and the and the third quartile. So I said, so, so this is yeah, so this is usually what they're gonna be getting out. As I just said, they want to really see if you um don't get tricked by by the way this looks. So it's not B either. There are fewer students with data values between the first quartile and the median than there are with data values between the median and the third quartile. So and it's not C either. There are approximately the same number of students with data values between the first quartile and the minimum. So it says the same, the same between the first quartile and minimum as there are between the third quartile and the maximum. And that's correct. The 25% of the total amount of students are in both regions. So the answer is going to be D. Problem eight. On the day before an election in a large city, each person in a random sample of 1,000 likely voters is asked which candidate he or she plans to vote for. Of the people in the sample, 55% say they will vote for can candidate Taylor. A margin of error of three percentage points is calculated. Which of the following statements is appropriate? Okay, so let's remember what um what this margin of error is. So it's centered at 55%. So our point estimate is 55, or let's just say 0.55 portion. Our point estimate is 0.55. And the margin of error basically is like a plus or minus from the from this point. So you can we add three percentage points to this 0.58 and take away three three percentage three percentage points so 0.52. So this is essentially their confidence interval. Um, it doesn't tell us the level of confidence, so you you know I'm sure they're not getting at that. So it's so um let's. So let's so let's just, let's just go through each one because this is really going to be based on the word. The proportion of all likely voters who plan to vote for candidate Taylor must be the same as the proportion of voters in the sample who plan to vote for candidate Taylor, which is fifty-five percent, because the data were collected from a random sample. Nope. I mean, it's possible that it could be. It's possible, but but they're saying must be, has to be, and it's like that. It's like this is just a sample. It could be closed or it could be it could be off um, by you know five percentage points. It's not there's no guarantee. It's not going to be a. The sample proportion minus the margin of error is greater than 0.5, which provides evidence that more that more than half of all likely voters plan to vote for Canada Taylor. Okay, so this one, this one's, this one seems like it, it makes sense. It seems legit. Like, um, like it's like remember th this is our confidence interval. Our confidence interval tells us a range of values that we would say are plausible. Um, again, doesn't mean that doesn't mean that um fifty percent can't be a value, but but this this is um. This is good evidence to support that the, her her percentage lies in here somewhere. So it just says provides evidence. It doesn't say it has to be. So this is this is going to be a good answer. So the answer is going to be this one. And let me just I can't briefly go over the rest to see if I can catch what they're trying to get you. It's not possible to draw any conclusion about the proportion of all likely voters who plan to vote with candidate. Candidate Taylor, because that 1,000 likely voters 
No, 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 this is wrong. One thousand enough. It is not possible to draw any conclusion about the proportion of all likely voters who plan to vote for. This is not. It's not going to be. It's, we don't. This is not an experiment. You know, that's totally different. Um. No, like, and, and E, it's not possible to draw any conclusion about the proportion of all likely voters who plan to vote for Candy Taylor because this is a random sample and not a census. No, and that census is, you know, uh, is what we dream of always. It, it's it's supposed to come and have data of, of everybody in the population. So it's um, something that's usually filled out by households every 10 years. And But anyways, it's not going to be for sure. So the answer is B. Number problem nine, the caffeine content of eight ounce cans of a certain cola drink is approximately normally distributed with mean 33 milligrams. A randomly selected eight ounce can containing 35 milligrams of caffeine is 1.2 standard deviation above the mean. Approximately what percent of eight ounce cans of the cola have a caffeine content greater than 35 milligrams? Okay, so we just gotta do some calculations, which is as long as you know, how to calculate standardized score would be fine. So we're going to be looking at this. Is there, is there an equation for a standard, you know, standardized score or a z-score? So um, the, has the, the, the mean is 33. So that mean is going to be 33. And um, the, Value selected at 35. So it would be 35 minus 33. And we're told it's 1.2 standard deviation above the mean. So Z is going to be 1.2. And remember, don't confuse this with the, the standard deviation being 1.2. I think that, that that's what they're going to try to get you with. It's not saying that the standard deviation is 1.2. Is saying that the z-score is 1.2. Um, so from here, if once we find our once we find our standard deviation, we can just then calculate the proportion above 35 milligrams. Because remember, we have a normal distribution with a mean of 33. We need to find the standard deviation, but we know 35 is going to be to the right somewhere. So we want to find this percentage. So we just do let's just do some algebra and solve for sigma or standard deviation. So it's two. So yeah, multiply both sides by the standard deviation. You got one point two standard deviations equals two. Divide both sides by one point two. You get sigma equals two divided by one point two, and that'll be about one point six seven. So then our normal distribution has a mean of 33 and a standard deviation of about 1.67. And then from here, we can just use our technology using our normal CDF function. So the distribution, normal CDF, lower bound in this calculator, which is 1.67, comma, upper bound, comma, and then this, or, this is gonna then no actually one thing, not one point six seven. We want to find the area above thirty five. Correct that. Thirty five comma thirty five, and the upper bound is put like a huge number. You could put like a million or ten thousand, something big. And then that's gonna be followed by the by the mean and standard deviation. So this is where I'm gonna enter 33 comma 1.67. Um, if you have a more advanced or newer version of this calculator, it's gonna be really easy to enter then because it's gonna have this like, like a set like space for, for what you put to um, find. So we get about 11.6%. So the best answer is going to be C. Okay. 
All right, number 10. A random variable x has a mean of 120 and a standard deviation of 15. A random variable y has a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 9. If x and y are independent, approximately what is the standard deviation of x minus y? Okay, so this deals with um, combining random variables. This is usually a tough chapter for students. Um, but this is really um, just based on a calculation. So if you remember um, that you can find um, the, the standard deviation of this, the standard deviation of the difference in x and y, by taking the square root of the variance, which is because that's just the, that's just the standard deviation squared. So what you want to find is what the variance is equal to. And this is going to come, this is going to seem counterintuitive, um, but, but just, you know, trust me, and you can always look back in chapter six, um, I go over this, but what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that the, the variance of a difference of random variables, if you're subtracting, you're still going to add them. So this would still be like the standard deviation of x squared plus the standard deviation of y squared. Even, even, even if, again, even if you're finding a difference. So from here, all we have to do is then find the square roots of 15 squared, we're told, plus 9 squared. So 225 plus 81. Off top of my head, it was 15. Yeah, here's six. And then find that square root. And it's all 17.5 ish. And the answer will be.